Hello everyone. On behalf of Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage in TAC and the TAC Conservation Institute, I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished speakers. We have three speakers today, Anne Shaftel, Kate Seymour, and Mrinal Neeman, and everyone who has joined us for today's talk in the Conservation Insights 2020 lecture series. I'm Dr. Padma Rila, Director ICID. Now to introduce our speakers. Anne Shaftel is a fellow of the International Institute for Conservation, a fellow of the American Institute for Conservation, and a member of the Canadian Association of Professional Conservators, ICOM Canada, and ICOMOS. She worked and trained at ICROM, the University of Delaware, Winterthur, and has a master's degree in Asian art history. Anne's current project, Treasure Caretaker Training, is an international award-winning initiative for preservation of Buddhist cultural treasures through projects and workshops in monasteries and communities. In response to questions from within the monasteries and created preservation of Buddhist treasure resource, free online at treasurecaretaker.com. Her clients include museums, archives, and universities worldwide. Her Canadian clients have included Department of National Defense, Officer of the Le uh, Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, and no Royal Ontario Museum. Now, our second speaker, Kate Seymour, is an art historian, conservator, and educator with a passion for easel paintings, conservation practice, and conservation science. She is the head of education as at, as, at the SRAL, a Maastricht, Netherlands. Her position entails supervising the practical and research work carried out by postgraduate painting students from the University of Amsterdam program. She also co-organizes and teaches modules at Maastricht University aimed at introducing conservation science to liberal arts and science bachelor students. She travels frequently abroad to give workshops on conservation practice and theory to mid-career conservators, integrating her material knowledge and practical skills with an ability to disseminate complex decision-making processes. Her interests include the structural treatment of both canvases and panel paintings, cleaning polychrome surfaces, filling and retouching systems, and varnish painted surfaces. In 2019, she was the project coordinator on the lecturing team for the Conser Conserving Canvas Mist Lining Workshops hosted at SRA SRAL, funded by the Getty Foundation. She currently leads the Indian Conservation Fellowship Program, ICFP at SARL, and that's how she is also associated with INTAC. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Mrinali Mani, has a master's, she's a third speaker. She has a master's in the conservation of works of art from the National Museum Institute, New Delhi, 1996, and previously obtained an MSc and MPhil in Botany from Madurai Karma University. She has additional training from the Leon Levi Foundation Center for Conservation Studies at Nagore, Rajasthan, and through the Indian Conservation Fellowship Program funded by Government of India and the Andrew Mellon Foundation in 2019-2020 which gave her a four-month study at SRAL at Maastricht, Netherlands. She currently works at Impact Bengaluru as center coordinator of the conservation division. During her career as a conservation professional, she has conserved artworks in various media with special interest in paintings of the Tanjavur and Mysore school, polychrome wooden sculptures, oil on canvas, cloth paintings, and prints. She's also been involved in conservation projects on site, including wall paintings from Virbhadra Temple, Lepakshi, Andhra Pradesh with ASI, Bagoti Haveli, Udaipur in Rajasthan in association with IASC, National Museum, New Delhi, and in Tamil Nadu, Sri Tyagaraj Swami Temple, Tiruvayur, and in Pak Chitrakala Parishad Art Conservation Center. She's been a resource person for conservation courses conducted by the Government Museum Chennai and also been invited by the State Archaeological Department, Government of Tamil Nadu, to deliver lectures on conservation of wall paintings for training programs conducted for the executive engineers and executive officers of temples controlled by Government of Tamil Nadu. Now, the title for today's talk is Tips and Tricks, Challenges and Solutions for Working on Site with Limited Resources. Now, working on site presents many challenges, especially when resources are limited, whether it be in a local setting on a far-flung foreign land. Aspects such as project design, funding, team building, and communication with stakeholders will be addressed by three different conservators who work on site 
in a variety of environments. Anne Schaffel will be discussing her, through her experience working internationally in monasteries, museums, and communities, including early preservation research in India in 1970. She'll be providing an insight into how to work within a nonprofit structure, teamwork, fundraising, pre planning communication, on site activities, and post project follow up. Kate Simor will discuss how on site projects provide connections with local communities and can be used to increase awareness of the conservation field and the need to care for our cultural heritage. She will outline suggestions for materials and equipments that can be prepared prior to moving on site and how to remain adaptive to the local environment. Kalni Mani will focus on how to develop a team that can adapt well to working with limited resources and working with local stakeholders, sharing her experience of working in churches, temples, and heritage buildings. So the tips and tricks discussed all aim to provide the conservator with the necessary tools to prepare for working on site with limited resources, how to make the most with the little. Now, before I invite our speakers, we will be starting with Anne first and then Kate, and then finally Mrinali will be joining us to do a talk. Before I join our speaker, before I request our speakers, may I please request all of you to mute your microphones. Please do type in your questions in the chat box. We'll be taking those right at the end of the talk. And if you do have a question addressed specifically to one of the speakers, please do mention that in the question. In the, in, while you're writing the question, it will be easy for me to address it to the right speaker. And also, please type in your name, organization name, and email. So, Anne, over to you. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much, Padma. I want to welcome everyone in your virtual personhood or joining us in replay. Greetings from our morning, noon, and night, wherever you are coming to you here from early morning in Canada. I hope that you and your loved ones are in good health in these days. These days, many of us are working virtually on site from our home offices. I began working physically on site in 1969. I was working on an archeological excavation in the Middle East and I was digging next to Annie Leibovitz, the famous photographer before she was famous. I think that was a really good start to working on site. Then in 1970, I started working in monasteries, interviewing and documenting traditional sacred art methods and materials. Until recently, on site was, well, the total site of my work. I always traveled, invited for consultations in museums and monasteries everywhere. This is the thing for this talk. Sometimes I'm invited as an individual conservation professional. Sometimes treasure caretaker training, a USA registered nonprofit is engaged for a project. But almost always we work with sacred art. The thing about sacred art is that everything is sacred to someone. As a guest in a monastery or a military museum, uh, yes, the thing is that this is sacred for the people who are there. And on a very personal level and a professional level, you wonder what to find something in a material object as being sacred. Is there a line up to where it's not sacred and then it becomes sacred? And how do we work as individuals, nonprofits, and in organizations with sacred art and a culture that may not be ours? As an individual, I work in many museums. I'm called in generally to consult about Tanka collections, which is my specialty here in Sweden and here at Yale University. And I really enjoy working either as an individual or through my nonprofit in monasteries. The more remote, the better. We do a lot of workshops. I say we and my nonprofit. Here I am as an individual teaching a Tanka preservation workshop to 
conservation professionals in New York City held at TALIS. And below, teaching basically the same thing to monks and nuns in Bhutan. And this is through my nonprofit, Treasure Caretaker Training. I do a lot of lecturing around the world. This is at the British Museum. And generally that's as an individual, but the audience always wants to know about what my nonprofit is doing in the monasteries. Today, I'll briefly run through two projects. One, one run as a nonprofit and one run as an individual and all the parameters of how to work with each. Both are similar. You have to deal with the collaboration with conservators and allied professionals. I love to collaborate with other conservators. You always engage the local community and I love to do conservation outreach. They differ in the approach and details of treatment. And it's really important to understand the legal ownership and the current guardians, especially when you're working with a nonprofit. Location and definitely the thing about it is that nonprofit work is different than either being employed by an institution as our next two speakers are, or working as an individual. Our first project to look at for as an example is treasure caretaker training, working in monasteries. We'll do a quick video. Crimes against cultural heritage treasures harm the history of humanity, the knowledge of civilization, and centuries-old legacies. Looters and antique hunters target historical relics, leaving behind the wreckage of a nation's heritage. In a race against time, treasure caretaker training teams preservation experts with technologically savvy monks and nuns from Buddhist monasteries. Workshop participants learn to create digital inventories of their own monastery's treasures using their smartphones and tablets for description, imaging, and video. With the dramatic and alarming rise in theft from monasteries and museums by the looters and antique hunters, proof of ownership is crucial. Risk assessment and disaster mitigation training help each participant to assess risk to the treasures in their own monasteries and to create action plans before disaster strikes. Using their smartphones and tablets, participants learn to conduct and record interviews with elders in their communities. The digital documentation of these living stories ensures the history of monastery treasures will be preserved and shared with future generations. That's embedded in the, my presentation if you want to watch the whole video later. So a treasure caretaker training uses the same risk assessment model that I teach, well, let's say in a naval museum, in small historical societies in the West, it's all science. The thing is that the monks and nuns are hugely practical and understand right away the examples of the risks and hazards in their own situations. This is done through our nonprofit. We have sustainability, which is so important for a nonprofit. In that this nun in 2005 was learning risk assessment in Bhutan, where I taught it. And then in 2016, she's teaching monks about risk assessment on site. And she's still working with us. Your nonprofit has to keep your content current. For example, in the earthquake uh, in Nepal, we definitely did a lot of uh, work there in Nepal. and. Um, helped with that as a nonprofit. And uh, with the current situation, we're keeping it uh, current, uh, writing a chapter about um, with the pandemic, how to relate to the um, cultural heritage treasures in your monastery during the pandemic. We teach documentation, treasure caretaker training, video interview of elders, safe storage, very important. And because 
our nonprofit cannot travel to do workshops at the moment, we're writing a resource that's available free online for the monks and nuns. It answers their questions and is illustrated with images from their monasteries. Although my conservation colleagues are finding it interesting. It's all the uh, risks and hazards categories, theft, fire, light. You can access this on our website. Now, let's say our treasure caretaker training nonprofit, what does it mean to have a nonprofit? Does it mean that you yourself do everything? Not exactly. We have in our team, a director, educators, two lawyers, three accountants, project visionaries, in-country advisors, affiliated professionals, my devoted family and friends, thank you. Endorsers who are respected, International Conservation Network, thank you to my colleagues. Graphic design, social media and video help, which is paid for. And one has to have 50 years of personal connections in the region which the whole thing runs on. Each project is created and funded separately. You're gonna ask me where the money comes from. Okay, these are your options to fund your nonprofit. Personal financial sacrifice, that's stress, a lot of it raising funds. We could be competent conservators, but we not, may not be great fundraisers. You can work with professional fundraisers, but that's expensive. When you form a nonprofit, in order to do so, you have to hire lawyers and accountants. The details of nonprofits differ from country to country, state to state, province to province, and you have to have a board for your nonprofit that's either helpful or not helpful. You can apply for foundation grants. You spend many hours researching foundations, more hours filling out their forms, so much time explaining your purpose and your budget to every foundation. Each foundation might fund a different part of your project. So one project, for example, in Sikkim, where I did, we did a workshop as a nonprofit, we had several foundations. Okay, if your nonprofit affiliates with a major organization, for example, UNESCO, um, as a conservator in private practice, it might be helpful. As a nonprofit, it might be helpful. However, you may still have all the responsibility for the project yourself, either individually or a nonprofit. You may work with the organization on one implementation and then they can recreate your heart project without you. The organization may come with international political complications in the country you're working in that have nothing to do with your project. And the history of that organization in that country may be more complicated than you wish. So if you don't have the backing of, um, let's say you're hired by a museum or INTOC or a conservation um, organization as your regular employer, and you go someplace, you don't have your team like that. So who do you work with on site? I love working with local affiliated professionals, local museum people, risk management, IT local experts, local police security and political contacts are great, community leaders crucial, local cultural caretakers totally important, that's who you're working with, and cultural officers from your own home country, from their embassy or high commission, and I'm a dual citizen, I always invite them into our projects. I love working with semi-affiliated professionals. Some examples of semi-affiliated professionals I work with in the countries I work in are the people that cook your food and uh, write the checks and uh, serve tea, we love tea. A tech venue without my Apple keynote lectures would not work on anybody's PC over there in India, in China, on the Middle East. Safe and consistent transport and local medical help when you're attacked by a monkey with a deadly brain virus as I have been and bitten by rabid dogs many times. You need your endorsers if you're having a nonprofit. Endorsers are very important, not only for fundraising, but to share the import of your project. You need testimonials from your participants. 
you need to do outreach. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, web page, constant contact, network for good, video, yes, email updates, and now Zooms. As conservators, we were trained in bench work, and now we're doing all of this. We have a website. For example, and we're almost done with the nonprofit, in a Sikkim preservation workshop, the funds were raised through international private foundations and the government of India. It had official government of India workshop status. We had a fabulous venue in Namjal Institute of Tibetology in Gangtok. We had wonderful venue affiliated professionals, delicious food and semi affiliated professionals, um, venue affiliated professionals like the curator and the director and venue uh, semi affiliated professionals. Obviously I care a lot about the food that we eat <laughs> and uh, participants who were in this case, monks, nuns, professional archivists, museum staff, army, police, secret police, art students, politicians, quite the mix. Let's go to, away from the world of nonprofit, to the world of an individual conservator in private practice. Here's an example in Nova Scotia. This is very Nova Scotia. It's, it was the Acadia building, a French settlement building. And uh, there was a water leak and people discovered there were amazing wall paintings under the wallpaper. I was hired as an individual conservator to organize the entire project, not through my nonprofit. This is the way it looked when I went, before, during, and after. This was a lot of work because I had to have a comprehensive plan, project plan, all by myself, not through my nonprofit. Blended with community engagement and social media outreach, we included a, as many as possible junior conservators in this and interns. Ongoing communication with the media, politicians, scholars. And this is sacred art. Why is this sacred art? Because it has the first Masonic imagery in North America that was covered over by subsequent, subsequent paint levels, lots of levels of paint. But here's the early sacred Masonic iconography that I was able to reveal. This is sacred art. Community engagement is so important. We had our hero who I revealed and the community came just to pose in front of him. All sorts of people. How did we raise the funds? Through the community, they raised the funds through several levels of government and private donors. I thank my conservation colleagues for their support. When I work alone, I love support. For example, Canadian Conservation Institute scientists did a fabulous job before I even got there in doing analysis. And while I was working there, thank you, CCI, other painting conservators and architectural experts. Thank you, my interns and junior conservators. And thank you to the visitors and to the Masonic Lodge. Again, you wonder what happens either through a nonprofit or as an individual after you leave a project that you put your heart and soul into. And in this case, it depends again on the community. They funded it and they're in charge of it. This is my run through in my 10 minutes of working on site with limited resources as a nonprofit, in this case, treasure caretaker training and as an individual conservator in private practice in the preservation of the painted room. I look forward to your questions. Uh, and if you have any further questions about organizing a nonprofit or getting funding, I'd love to hear them, as well as your questions about the sacred nature of the projects I just showed you. Thank you so much. Now we'll have, what would you do? Thank you so much, Anne. That was a, such a great introduction. And uh, welcome again to everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. 
I think this is such an amazing uh, resource to be able to reach out to the whole global world um, from my own uh, studio in Maastricht in the Netherlands. So I really very much appreciate being invited by INTAC in New Delhi. It's been great to work with them over the last years um, with the Indian Conservation Fellowship Program. And uh, hi to everybody in uh, India and the rest of the world. Well, welcome um, to my part of this um, um, three-legged stool, let's call it. Um, I would like to just, uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, introduce myself, uh, Padma did that a little bit, and my institution. My institution is also a nonprofit. Um, we've been running for about 30, 35 years now almost. We're situated in the Netherlands, uh, in Maastricht, and um, we were set up uh, to work within the cultural heritage sector in um, the province of Limburg, the rest of the Netherlands, and now globally, to do conservation, restoration, education and training, research and development, preventive conservation and advice. We deal with artworks that are painted, um, so easel painting, sculpture, historic interiors, gilt leather, modern and contemporary art. And our Department of uh, Historic Interiors, as well as uh, our other um, staff members, we often work on site. And uh, what we have um, would like to share with you, and I'm the representative of my institution today, is some tips and tricks about um, what we and, and how we have been working uh, on site um, and how we use that to um, do public outreach, to engage with uh, stakeholders and uh, to be advocates for the conservation profession. So without further ado, um, what is working on site? Well, it has many forms and I'm going to show some of them in today's presentation. Um, this is one, it's home away from home. Uh, we worked uh, early on this year before um, the pandemic um, caused everything to, to run to a halt a little bit. Um, this is a on-site uh, laboratory that we set up in a local museum in a city called Heerlen, some 30 kilometers from here. And it was a, a two, three day um, session um, called Treasures from the Attic. Um, this was a little bit like, I don't know if anybody watches the BBC, the, road to, uh, the Antiques Roadshow, where um, local people could bring their treasures and we could look at them and study. And uh, you see here uh, my colleagues, Renee and Arnold, as well as some uh, students working on this. This is on site, but we had this planned. Um, we had a dedicated area in the museum set up for us with tables, electricity, lights, and we could bring some basic instruments like microscopes, tools of the trade and so on. You can see them on the tables there. And we could bring them to be able to look and study the artworks. So in such on site, but not so much different from what we have at home. Uh, we often also work on site in on large projects dealing with um, big collections. Um, you see here the inset of a castle in uh, a city called Utrecht, near a city called Utrecht, called Castle Amerongen. Um, we worked there for roughly um, five to eight years um, on the castle, its collection, and all the painted interiors there. Um, the castle was closed during this time to public, although tours were allowed to come round. And um, some of the artworks needed uh, quite substantial treatments. They were moved and transported to our studios in Maastricht to deal with, but others, it would have cost too much money and it's too risk, um, risky to send these artworks. They needed minimum treatment. And you see here a team we're working on site and uh, we set up a temporary studio there. Um, the temporary studio actually lasted uh, a little bit more than temporary. It was about two or three years um, while we worked on, I think about, um, you know, over a hundred paintings on site. So you see some of our team members there doing some action there. And again, this means that you can um, set something up with uh, the facilities that you would have in your home studio. It's a little bit temporary. So you're doing uh, makeshift, uh, making makeshift tables, um, but you have your equipment and tools and you have storage for all of that. 
Working on site can also be uh, working on a project. And here you see our team reinstalling a gilt leather. This is um, leather that is painted and gilded to look uh, very beautiful in a uh, town hall interior in uh, Harderwijk. Um, some of our other team working in the city hall here in Maastricht and in churches. And these are often temporary situations where you're working on high, on scaffolding, and um, you need to be a little bit more prepared. Take your tools and equipment with you and uh, make sure that you have thought things through beforehand. Working on site can bring lots of challenges, how to get the equipment up to the uh, top of the scaffolding, the town hall project you see in the middle, this was 10 meters high in the ceiling. And sometimes it can be a little bit precarious. You see my colleague Arnold working on a sculpture in a church there on a ladder. Um, we have to be, make sure that we have the right safety equipment, the right clothing, the right uh, tools and so on. And we have to be a bit more prepared. I'll come back to this preparation aspect in a little while. And occasionally we get to work on the outside of buildings and uh, very much up high. Um, here we see my colleague Angelique Fredericks uh, actually uh, earlier this week. Uh, looking at um, the original paint decoration on the outside of a house in Nijmegen. So here uh, we had to deal with um, permissions to close the street to be able to put this, we call it in English, a cherry picker in the street and to be able to, to safely reach up to the areas that are necessary for the research here. Uh, Angelique goes further, she takes um, small samples away from the outside and then goes to work on this in the lab to figure out the correct color um, paint that was used uh, with the um, original decoration. Um, we also work with many on-site projects. Um, this is a current project that is going on in the Museum of Roman Catacombs in Valkenburg, again, just down the road from us. This is a museum that is underground. Um, the quarries that uh, miners um, um, sourced stone for building in the local uh, hills were transformed at the beginning of the 20th century into a complete copy of the catacombs in Rome. And this is an open museum uh, but you see um, our team carrying out uh, restoration inside these caves. Um, they're up to two to three kilometers under the ground uh, with a constant temperature of about 14 degrees and a relative humidity of about uh, 60 to 80 percent. Um, this means we have to adapt our working practice we have to wear um, warm clothing to, to go through. And the museum is, is open. Um, tours, daily tours are running through the, build, uh, the, the, the museum um, and also watching our conservators at work. And this gives a wonderful opportunity to do a little bit more of that outreach that Anne was talking about earlier. Um, we meet local people and we meet tourists, we meet stakeholders and uh, we meet other interested parties. And it's a really opportune time to inform our public of what we are doing, the importance of this heritage and its necessity to conserve it. Another very famous project here in South Limburg. Um, some of you may recognize the image here. It's not by Rembrandt, but this is a copy of Rembrandt's Night Watch. Um, that was painted in the caves and a different set of caves, this time in Maastricht, um, at, again at the, uh, well, at the end of the 19th century. Um, these, uh, this, this wall painting is made with carbon directly painted onto the limestone and you can see the damage and graffiti over time as uh, people have walked past uh, this area. These caves are full of these types of artwork. They're beautiful, but this is the most famous one, I think. Um, this is a project that ran over two winters um, while um, my team member Angelique here uh, was the project leader. Again, it's a difficult to area to work in. Um, we couldn't work there full time because of the 
the coldness and the dampness, it really got to your bones. It's not like working in India. Um, so there was limited hours and um, while trekking through these caves, again, it's, it's about a kilometer and a half from the surface, mean that you have to take everything with you and think a little bit about it. Um, none of the materials could be left overnight because it grew mold. Um, so we had to be very careful and think about um, being prepared about what to bring in uh, further. Um, we have more projects on site. I'm just going to run through some of these because we are short on time here. But again, you see my colleague, Claudia Junge, on top of a scaffolding with all her pigment pots ready to go. And this is transported up and left in situ. Um, modern art is also not a stranger to us. Um, here we're bringing the outside in in this project. Uh, Lydia Berkens, my colleague here, is working on this Keith Haring. Uh, this is a project from some time ago, 2014, and uh, it is actually on the outside of a shipping container that was left um, near the beach and had lots of damage and it has been bought by private uh, um, uh, private uh, funds and uh, restored and is now still um, accessible outside. So what do you do when you need to prepare to go on site? You need to take your materials, but how do you get your cupboard full of materials? I'm showing here on the left into a, a small uh, toolbox to be able to travel. You have to shrink everything down and be prepared, make things beforehand. So um, it, my advice is to think a little bit about the materials that you're going to use, perhaps do a pilot project um, to do some tests, go back to the studio, make up small batches of materials, whether it be adhesives or varnishes or um, so on, and transport it there. Small little pots of pigment, like I'm showing you here, can also be um, pre-prepared to a palette of your desire and necessity and then taken away. Um, tools is the other aspect. Um, how the top image you see here is my tool uh, shelf and my studio. How do I condense this wonderful supply of materials into something much smaller that I can easily uh, manage um, and carry with me, uh, whether it's down to the caves or up onto the scaffolding. Well, you can see the uh, wider range of different implements that I have below, and it may mean that I'm selecting one or two of these and putting them into a tool roll and being able to transport them. Um, this may not seem, uh, you know, rocket science to everybody, but, you know, be aware of what it is that you need to take and really think and, and select um, those instruments. If you can, and if you have electricity, you can take smaller uh, lab equipment like the magnetic stirrer, the heating, and the hot needle that I'm showing in the bottom down there. Um, other aspects that we, we really um, have to do on site often is things like condition checking. And again, here, having the right tools and being able to, to um, resource these, like a simple optivizer instead of a microscope, and perhaps good torches and lights. Now, I've been lucky to be given by my uh, uh, family members as a sort of personal donation to my working uh, um, uh, practice, these two wonderful um, museum torches. Uh, one is UV light and one is uh, in visible light. They're quite expensive. Uh, there are cheaper ones on the market. And the other way to source funding for this sort of thing is to ask specifically for funders to provide funds for this kind of instrumentation. Um, don't be afraid to jury rig things. Um, here we are seeing an on-site uh, setup for photo documentation. Um, and I'll come back to this project later. So you can see here from tools and equipment that we uh, found in the local market, we were able to set up a um, very professional photo studio for both a visible and UV light. But don't be afraid to ask for help and get uh, other stakeholders to participate. There are organizations that will provide a mobile laboratory for you to use on site. 
and uh, getting simple things like a, a portable microscope, which I'm showing here on the left of the screen with a digital camera he helps and aids your documentation at no end. And if you need to get a little bit more technical, you can hire in instruments like the XRF uh, for pigment analysis that I'm showing above and even the X-ray machine showing below. My screen didn't fit on all the other mobile instruments that you can possibly take on site. So to conservation outreach and, um, and uh, awareness, make every opportunity count. Try to engage with your local community, set up a workshop um, and um, get your experts involved. Invite people to your site. Um, it's really important, whether it be local school children, to village elders, to um, the local university, get people involved. Um, don't be afraid to jazz it up, make it look professional. Um, give some didactics, uh, but also don't be afraid to be flexible and just set up shop wherever you are. Um, outreach to all generations and all parts of the community. We are dealing with a shared culture, uh, shared cultural heritage, and it is for everybody to enjoy and to preserve. And also think a little bit about public engagement. Try to, um, to uh, increase the public awareness and understanding of what it is you're seeing here. Here we're seeing an interior of a church. It's a very early uh, wall fresco painted in oil that has completely faded. And in the bottom right image, you can see a projection of a 19th century copy of this same um, project on the wall to help it public understand what they're seeing. Get the press involved. It's very important to have that outreach, call up your local newspaper and get them to write a report, invite them multiple times throughout the project so that they can see progress. This is uh, really a good uh, um, seller for the public. And finally, um, I've just got one more slide after this, um, be flexible. Um, here we are seeing a, a workshop that I set up with the uh, NCA in India. I know that some of the audience came to this. It's wonderful to see you all again on this platform. And in Alwar, we set up a local uh, workshop space and, um, and lecture hall within the gallery space itself. Uh, and this allowed the general public to come in and view but it also allowed us to do conservation work and practice as well as hold uh, educational uh, workshops within the space. And here we are, the last slide, with a little bit of local Hindi promotion for these kinds of workshops. So congratulations to all of you who work on site. It's not an easy feat. And uh, I really just like to and my part of this presentation with a thank you to all of these people who have uh, contributed to these projects and uh, my work on site. So be safe, be careful and be prepared. And I'd like to hand over now to uh, Milani. Thank you, Kate. Um, so uh, I take the baton of the relay from Anne and then Kate. So this is the last leg of the talk. Um, so Many, your voice is mute. You're on mute. Your phone. Yeah. 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 Get the back slide. Okay, fine. Uh, so I would, um, I, I'd like to thank uh, Kate for uh, handing over the baton. And I'm on the last leg of this uh, Zoom session. Um, thank, uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, Kate for inviting me. And, um, you know, so the, uh, in one way, the pandemic has been good because we've been able to connect across the world, which we probably would not have been uh, doing if we, were, we had to physically travel. So there has been a lot of exchange of knowledge that's been happening in the, for the last few months. Um, 
uh, I would like to talk about the these issues, like you know, issues of manpower, equipment, materials, documentation, and practicalities. So the talk was tips and challenges of working with limited resources on site. And the question is, why do we say limited resources? Because whenever you have an on-site project, you would do your assessment, you would do your testing, and you would go in with a plan. But conservation, as you know, is not um, what an, uh, any other profession is. So, you know, there is, uh, especially at site, you can be uh, thrown a surprise, you know, a googly when you start working. So therefore, this issue of uh, limited resources does uh, crop up. And um, so talking about manpower, uh, that's one of the most important resources that you have when you are working at site. Next, Kate. Yeah, so what is manpower? It's like you, when you're talking of limited resources, like at uh, um, INTAC, the organization that I belong to, uh, and the INTAC Conservation Institute at Bangalore has been there for more than uh, a quarter of a century, a little shy of three decades. Uh, we are a very small team. So, you know, it becomes, that becomes crucial when you have an on-site project who do you select to send to site and who do you hold back to work in office because you cannot send the whole team to site and shut down the uh, lab or the office. So that becomes very crucial. So, you know, you will have to uh, uh, plan in such a way that certain people go in first. You have to go uh, know the strengths of your team. You have to know who to send at what phase of the project. So that becomes very crucial. And if you send the wrong person at the wrong time, you're going to stretch the limited resources. Um, then the second is to recruit additional hands. Obviously, you know, some large projects would require hands. So we do, rec we did this project, which was uh, in another city in Chennai, which is the on-site. But this was a sub on-site, you can say, which was in Bangalore, but not an office. We hired a space. And we had additional hands who were local. So, you know, uh, it took care of a lot of things of expenses and, uh, you know, uh, uh, monitoring and all that. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult. So this is what I say when you say managing the resources, then you have to work your way so that you do not kind of, uh, you, you do, it's not like a make do with what you have. You have to optimize what you have. Uh, next, Kate, please. Okay, next, yeah, thank you. Uh, next is the equipment, you know, so usually an on-site always requires a scaffolding. Uh, what you see on my, on the left, the, this uh, image is uh, something that is like uh, the traditional or the conventional scaffolding, which is made of wooden uh, poles. And uh, so at this site that we were working on, you know, that was around 6,000 square foot of paintings, wall paintings that needed to be treated. So if we went with the conventional mode of scaffolding, we would have covered the whole area or we would have had to, you know, restrict the scaffolding to a small portion and then you could not work in other portions. So, you know, you, uh, that would have been. So that was the first time that we decided to get a mobile scaffolding done that could be moved. And instead of carting it from, you know, 500 kilometers from the site, uh, from the lab, we got it made locally with the locally available material. Uh, and uh, this was the scaffolding. It was, uh, we could adjust it, the height could be adjusted and uh, it was made uh, locally at probably a fraction of a cost that a ready-made uh, lightweight scaffolding would have costed us. The next, so sorry, the next is talking about sourcing, yeah. So the, we had this also, like for example, we had this issue where because the site that we were working on, though we, you would call it a wall painting site, but it was uh, more on the ceiling painting. So, you know, we had to consolidate and we needed to give pressure. So how do you give pressure? Because you know that gravity is going to act. So we kind of then decided what would work. And we went to a junk shop and got the car jack, you know, the tire changing jack. And then we had this ensemble where it was put on a stool and things like that. But then that we realized that it was not a very safe thing to do. So one of the team members was uh, ingenious enough uh, to kind of come up with a, a drawing of, uh, a, a, you know, a, what to call it a lever or whatever. And then 
we got that again made at site you know in the local town we just sourced somebody and we got it done uh, at, so we didn't have to rush back and forth to the head office or you know back to base to pick up stuff so uh, next so materials coming to materials talking of selection sourcing and alternatives now how do you select your materials now kate said that you know, you select your materials, you uh, decide at, uh, you know, at back at the lab what you want to carry with you and go. But what do you do when you are, uh, you encounter a site like this where we could not step back into this last portion because this whole place was filled with uh, this kind of junk and we were uh, uh, worried whether we would land up, you know, stepping on a snake or a scorpion. So. Uh, from being art conservators, we would have become wildlife conservators. So we did our tests in the portion that was exposed. And at the back, we come up with something like this, which no chemical that we had tested and we had carried with us from Bangalore worked. So the question was, now do we get material from back home or what do we do? So then you asked locally and discovered there was a shop that did sell uh, scientific chemicals in town Though it, this was like a very small town, so we did not expect to have it. And we were able to do our tests, you know, with whatever, do our study, do our tests, and be able to solve the problem. So you'll have to always keep your eye out for alternatives, look out for sources, like the present project that we are doing, which I'm not able to share the pictures. We Before we set out, we kind of sourced a supplier close to the site instead of, you know, it going across two states, uh, that was it. Thank you. Next, Kate. So we also had this, we wanted to make the lime uh, uh, slurry and the lime plaster. So we, we did source a man locally who was an expert, but he was the only one. So, you know, he was charging a king's ransom. So we got a team from Intag Bangalore, who uh, Intag Bhuneshwar, uh, who were Orissa, who were experts in line to come and train us. So, you know, this is our conservator getting trained at site. And then he took over and then we were uh, we were able to do this. So, you know, it was like we were using locally available materials, conventional materials, traditional materials, vis-a-vis -vis the contemporary ones, which we could not test. So we had limited resources. So we, it, the job was to be done. So, you know, and uh, the traditional materials are time tested. So we've decided to go with it. Next. So then where do you test your materials? So at times you come back to lab, you have a back-end office kind of a thing if you can't test it size. So you make your samples back in the lab and do it. Or you make your uh, samples at site so that you know, you're testing. It is in um, uh, connaissance with the uh, environment, local environment and all, and do your testing. And because this was to be go going up on the ceiling, the first one was on the pillars, then the next one was on the beams, so that we would know how the gravity would work with it. Next, Kate. Next, Kate. Yeah, thank you. Okay, documentation. Coming to documentation. Documentation is a very important part of the any conservation project. So if you can afford, you can get a touch screen, touch pad. But then at that point of time, this is where we are talking about like maybe about 15 to 12 years back when we, could, we didn't have these resources, then it was like either do a line drawing, but these, this was like a narrative panel with very complicated drawings. We would be sitting there for months together just to do the documentation. So we came up with this idea of creating a grid, you know, uh, using just nylon wires. We created a grid one, uh, one foot by one foot tied it so I, we broke the narration into panels you know we numbered them saying that the area between two pillars would be one panel numbered them and then we just did the normal graphic documentation with symbols and uh, this helped us to plan a conservation uh, strategy uh, for the project next kit Then coming to practicality. So whatever you plan, there are a lot of these um, unknowns that exist. One is the climate because uh, uh, intact Chitrakala, uh, the intact conservation institute at Bangalore is the only uh, conservation institute in the south. So we, we land up doing projects across the four states. 
so the climate is very different this is like a, a project that we did in tamil nadu which is on the sea coast and because the uh, restoration of the structure was also happening simultaneously the conservators had to work in this kind of a cage which is almost like a gas chamber so you know people are stepping out every few minutes to kind of breathe out you know the breathe in and then so these are things that then you know uh, eat into your time schedule uh, also into the morale of the team there are so many things that affect your uh, uh, productivity dress code is another thing that we encounter here in the south very regularly because most of the places we work in are of a uh, religious kind so you know you they are expect us to wear a certain dress code which is not very comfortable when you're working so that also becomes an issue you know you're not comfortable working so again your um, uh, sorry uh, you know uh, productivity comes down food is again a major uh, uh, issue that happens you know an army marches on its stomach so if we, uh, if the food is not okay then you know people have to cook their food the team has to cook so that that means that at the end of a tiring day if you have to come and cook to eat becomes quite um so these are things that need to be taken into religious sentiment you can't wear your footwear when you are working in a temple and you know uh, like i remember this temple and uh, the project that we were doing in tamil nadu in the temple it was like a kilometer walk it was one of the largest temples it was a kilometer walk from the actual site to the uh, temple authorities office you know every time i had to wear, walk barefoot on the stone and i would be jumping doing hop scotch onto the grass and the grass would have nettles so it was like back and forth uh, you know so and obviously you can't afford to also um, have an injury or whatever because they you know you know the project kind of derails uh, working along with other professionals again like i talked to you about this so you know you have to anticipate that this is what you'll be working and then try to plan in such a way that you know you are work your work does not get disturbed because of this and the final thing is the bureaucratic and the official processes in india you know it does take time at times by the time you get to site you are uh, your, your proposal has been submitted two years back and then you're getting to site so already you know your funding has cut down because of uh, the increasing expenses the increasing salaries and things like that and also at times there is also this uh, when you start the project there's a particular officer sitting who understands what you're doing and by the time you've gone to site somebody has they've been transferred there's somebody he coming in and you know you start from scratch or uh, to uh, update them so these are practical difficulties that we do have at site Mm, and then also when you talk of this places of worship you know you're working with um, um living temples so to say the living temples you suddenly they decide that there's a festival so you guys can't work for four days so what do you do in such cases so you know these are things that you need to anticipate though it is very difficult to anticipate but then uh, you you have a plan a plan b plan c but at times you, nothing works so you have to be like i would like to say be a scout and be prepared Uh, next so i would like to say the resources may be limited but the imagination and knowledge are unlimited so you know don't read up just on conservation you read up on every subject because in conservation we all know that we our tools materials are all borrowed from other fields like for example a simple thing like a uh, you know a jeweler's loop or the watchmaker's uh, glass it you can use it as instead of a microscope if you just need about 10x magnification i have done it to look at the anatomical uh, structure of a wood for identification similarly we take a surgeon scalpel uh, to the maybe you know to the other end that is the lidar so read up on other fields so that you know at times where to borrow from um, instead of just like trying to specialize in your field this would definitely help you when you are working in field um and i would like to acknowledge uh, uh, the intact conservation institute padma for giving us giving me the opportunity kate obviously as i've told you that uh, bringing me on board and all the conservators who have worked at the intact conservation institute over the years because without their work these projects wouldn't have come through and uh, we've always we are a non for profit organization so we've always worked on a shoestring budget but we do have a reputation for delivering the goods thank you 
Thank you, Manalini. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think um, with your permission, I'll see if I'll take on the questions now. Kate, Anne, are you able to hear me? Yes. 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 So, yes. So we'll start with the very first question that was um, for Anne. What about confidentiality when it comes to you going into monasteries and nunneries and seeing their sacred practice art? Uh, the question's about confidentiality, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Well, as conservators, we're trained in client confidentiality from the beginning. We respect whatever culture or um, situation we're going into and confidentiality is a given. Uh, when you're going into a closed society that's not your own, like a monastery, or in my case, working for um, naval museums, for example, confidentiality is something we were trained in, we believe in, and we are consistent with. I think that the reason that my projects have uh, been invited back again and again to monasteries is because they respect that we respect their confidentiality and we never share information except if it's with their express permission. Yes, it's a good question because confidentiality is very important, especially when dealing with sacred art. Great question. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I don't know whom to address it, but it's about can anyone tell me about line testing handbook? Lime testing handbook, I'm not very sure. Um, is there anything like a lime testing handbook? Any resources that you can refer? I don't think so, uh, Padma. I think they can refer to the probably the lime testing uh, unit at uh, Lucknow. Mm -hmm. There is also a very good resource in Scotland called the Lime Institute. Um, I don't have the details off the top of my head, but I could find them for you. Um, it's a, a centre that practices historical um, building techniques, and uh, they also have, a, um, I think, some online resources. So I could try and find that and get back to somebody. Okay, thank you, Kate. Thank you for answering that. So... The next question is for all presenters. So one at a time, maybe. With so many community members with different priorities, what do you find is a universal appeal of conservation to communicate in so many different community members from secret police to owners of artwork, etc.? cetera? Anne, do you want to answer that first? Yes, happy to. I think that um, people across all categories understand that they're just the guardians of their cultural heritage treasures at the moment, that there was history before them and that their generations coming after them. And they all care about the preservation of these treasures for coming generations. And so that cuts across any um, demographic description so for example, in one workshop, I had 10 year old monks mm -hmm. and I had um, very respected, venerable archivists. And we all were on the same page of why we were there and why we were reviewing these procedures. And it was a lot easier um, to find the commonality in this than the, the questioner might have imagined. It was, um, yeah, it was clear why we were there. and. Um, there was no conflict at all, but it is a good question. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Oh, thank you, Anne. Kate, would you like to give your take on it? Yeah, it is a very good question. It's very interesting. I think in in my local area, in Europe, at least, uh, um, it's a fascination. I think uh, we work with something that people are not usually ex don't usually have access to it's behind the scenes it's like behind the curtain it's almost like the wizard of oz you're going there looking for the secret of these things and there is a fascination to understand how things are made and i, I think we reveal that and 
as well as giving a reverence and um, an importance to culture and to cultural heritage and its history. So I think for the museum visitor, we see this also on, in our uh, open studio. We have a studio in a museum that is open to the public and people are just fascinated to see how they work. And, and maybe this will make you laugh. One of the comments that we get here, it's in Dutch, but I'm gonna translate into English is, isn't your work like a monk's? Because we are dealing with such small areas and with such attention to detail and with such concentration. And I think that that fascinates them too, this, this idea that we are really intimate with the objects. And I have a problem when I go to museums is I want to touch all the artworks that are there. So I'm always with my nose in the painting almost and being told off by guards, get away from that. So I think that that's, that's what fascinates and, and why we can make that connection with, uh, with people and uh, visitors and our stakeholders. And Nalini, would you like? Um, yeah, I, uh, so it's like uh, many a time in India because you know that most of the art is uh, connected to religion. Uh, there's no that separation of it's, you know, at times it's just a part and parcel of uh, the life. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember when I joined the National Museum Institute for my master's in conservation and my professor said, oh, you come from Tamil Nadu, there's some amazing wall paintings. And I was like, for me at that point of time, wall paintings were only Ajanta and Endora. So I'm like, wall paintings where? And he says, in your temples. And then it struck me, you know, every temple has a narration of the legend of that temple, which you take it for granted. You don't realize it's something unique, which needs to be protected. So in what we realized is like when we were working in the site in uh, Tamil Nadu, many people didn't know the existence of the, uh, these paintings. So then uh, aware, creating awareness in education becomes very crucial for uh, you know, the, uh, the conservation process to continue because you will do the intervention conservation, but the conservation process is maintaining it later on. So, you know, at times, uh, because like we are talking of limited resources, you never get to go back to the site that you have conserved, you know, so you leave it at the mercy of the locals. So, uh, therefore, you need to educate the locals and once they realize the importance, the significance, then you do have some people who call you, you know, suddenly and say, you know, they're trying to do this, what, what do you want to do? So, uh, that is there and I think in India now that there's a lot of awareness that's happening about the culture that we have, about the heritage we have and uh, slowly things are changing. So it is not like earlier where, you know, people would just go and whitewash things or you know, people call you and ask you, you know, what is the kind of light that you want to put. Uh, so that is coming across. So I think good days are there for us now in the future. Also, if I may add, it's also the whole idea that something can be salvaged, something can be improved upon the before and after results. That also mm -hmm. has a magical, so to say, you know, an appeal to everyone. The fact that, that something can be, in fact, you know, something can be treated and there are people who can have the knowledge and the skill to do that. I think as a um, profession, something. absolutely. And then I think Padma, but at times what happens at uh, wall painting sites, because you're working with historic sites, you're not doing an, um, uh, what do you call it? An aesthetic reintegration. So, you know, at times they're asking you, what have you done kind of, you know, there's no work done, you know, <laughs> so you've, uh, you've broken your back, you work like Michelangelo sitting on uh, the scaffolding with a neck cricked up. And then somebody comes and says, doesn't seem to have done any work there. So, you know, you also have that kind of uh, yes. thing, so. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is, um, what measures can be taken to conserve excavated bones, skeletons on excavation sites, especially in humid and arid climates? Anyone who has an experience amongst you who's worked with excavated bones, skeletons on excavated sites? No. No. no, it's really a different field completely. Yeah. And I would call um, somebody mm -hmm. who, who has experience with this. Um, this would not mm -hmm. be a, a, a challenge that I could take up, but that uh, there are very special yeah. uh, sets of circumstances that need to be considered. So there are protocols involved as well, if you, if you are having excavated bones and excavation itself, so yeah. 
The next question is, how do you tackle language barriers while working across different sites? Does this in a way affect the way work is done? Is having a translator enough in such cases? Um, so should I take that? Go uh, for it. So, <laughs> uh, We've never had issues because one is the team at Bangalore has uh, people speaking the languages from the four or five states. And uh, I have working knowledge in a couple of languages, which I kind of do manage. And we've had, in, initially, we would have some uh, problems in communicating. But uh, quite a lot of the team members have picked up the language, you know, staying on site. So we've never needed, a, we've had somebody to help us translating probably in the beginning or when things are a little complicated. And then um, thankfully in the South, practically everybody speaks English or, you know, you do have uh, at some places, though Hindi is a little rare, but you, you do have people with working knowledge of English. So we, we have managed so far without having a, you know, to hire a separate translator or an interpreter. I think a question more for Anne. Anne, you've been to such remote places. I'm sure language was a barrier. How do you cope with that? Maybe a more interesting answer or maybe a more difficult challenge for regions where you have been, perhaps? I'm very comfortable working with translators. For one thing, all of our didactic material, we like to have translated into whatever languages is um, available to people before we go. And so we use translators all the time on site. I prefer to use translators who are within our participant community. In other words, a monk who speaks, uh, let's say he may speak uh, Mandarin, uh, Tibetan, Nepali, and Hindi. And he, he, I have used such a monk as a translator and he was amongst our participants. So we use translators all the time. And um, I, think that um, it's just a way of working that you have to get familiar with. Um, I'm pretty fast on learning languages, so sometimes I can pick up what people are saying if they think I'm not understanding or slight nuances in um, technical language. And so that therefore having the didact didactic material translated before where we can review it and check it um, and then we uh, send it to people is, is really useful. Um, in a literary sense, and um, an on-site working with translators has never been a problem. Uh, for example, our video that you saw in English is translated into Mandarin, Cantonese, Tibetan, Vietnamese, etc. So um, I think that translation is part and parcel of our work, and um, we actually quite enjoy it. We, we love to um, I innovate using our technical terms, um, especially discussing sacred art and um, preservation in different languages. And as I said, it's easier to check translation beforehand with didactic material. Yeah, but it's a great question about translation. I rather enjoy working with translators and the whole thing. And, um, and I also enjoy situations where the participants are speaking maybe six different languages. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Um, yeah, it's it's one of the challenges that you get to love. Yeah. Thank you. Kate, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it is, it's, it's a huge challenge sometimes, language, and it's fun. Um, often I'm working in a workshop scenario where I'm teaching mid-career conservators, but uh, in English with translators. And uh, sometimes that gets very interesting because often the translators um, don't have the technical knowledge that is necessary for communicating these nuances in our field. And there was one time where the audience was in stitches and I couldn't understand why they were laughing so much. And it was a very young, and she, I've worked with her for many years after this as well. She's, she's really picked up on the, on the terminology. But I was talking about solvents and she was uh, translating polar solvents into cold and uh, the audience was having so much fun with it because they uh, obviously knew because they are mid-career that they didn't mean cold solvents but um, uh, the opposite oh, of non solvents. <laughs> um, so you know often it's it helps when we work with the translators like Anne mentioned and um, with this 
particular group of translators. We've been working with them for about seven years now, and they're really building up a um, the lexicon of, of language and they've been instrumental in helping us um, in other scenarios as well. So I think uh, that's important. And I love the idea of, you know, double publications in, mm -hmm. in multiple languages. Um, there's an organization I work with a lot called uh, Dutch Masters Abroad. And we've had a, a lot of our, our publications translated into English and Russian um, from Dutch. Um, so um, they're, they're, they're available too. And that, that becomes a, a really good resource for the, the local communities. Thank you. This question again for all presenters. Are there some sites you've been to where physical preservation is not possible and a digital preservation has been taken on by the local community? Uh, how are they maintaining the digital preservation without introducing more problems? This is for everyone, if they're aware of any site where digital conservation has taken place. Well, I liked Anne in Anne's presentation and her video, yeah. she was in her yeah. monks being, uh, you know, the technically savvy monks, I think they said, uh, yeah. working with our smartphones. I think that's, uh, maybe you've got something more to say, Anne, about that. Yes, uh, these days we're encouraging digital preservation. I mean, so much is possible. Uh, in terms of when people look at um, in a Western museum and they see the paintings all looking perfect and then um, on site things don't look perfect within a culture because they're part of a living heritage. And so we encourage um, digital uh, preservation and digital restoration and not um, a challenging um, the longevity and uh, true historic nature of originals. So digital um, restoration is where we're going with this in all cases, definitely. Um, even working with my conservators, we're going more to digital. After all, um, if you have an original and you go into the, let's say 20 years ago, conservation mode that I'm going to clean it and restore it as it would have looked, you're really guessing you're not, you don't 100% know that's your opinion, what it would have looked like. So with digital, if you just stabilize the original and then you can take high density images and you can um, restore those to your heart's content without damaging the original, that's where we're going. And I think it's a very, very good direction. After all, most people in the world see their art and cultural heritage from around the world in a digital format on their tablets, on their phone, on their computer. So that's what they're dealing with. They're dealing with cultural heritage treasures in a digital, digital form. So therefore, um, you can have the original as is and the cultural heritage treasure, if you wish it to look perfect, digitalized and a digitalized um, to your idea of perfection. I definitely, especially working with sacred art, believe in uh, maintaining the historical evidence of its life as a sacred art object and not trying to transform it into the perfection of an art object. So therefore, digital restoration is definitely something that I approve of and encourage. Okay. I think we don't have any more questions. So a big thank you to all of you, all three of you for a wonderful presentation. I think we had a very nice session and some very good questions, interesting questions as well. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Brinalini, for taking out the time and doing the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and staying on. So that's all for me. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you.